Okay, today is uh, the third uh, lecture uh, in a series on prime production and phytoplankton in the ocean. And as I, as I mentioned before, we're spending so much time on these organisms because of their importance, obviously, and setting the stage for everything else that happens in the marine habitat. So before we get into the lecture, I thought I should point out um, a few things about this uh, picture. Obviously, it's taken alongside of a ship, an oceanographic ship. And what you're looking at here is what's called a CTD. It's a rosette really uh, containing the bottles. Each one of those bottles, a little bit hard for me to see, maybe uh, collect maybe 20 liters or so. Uh, it's called a CTD because it stands for uh, uh, conductivity, temperature, and density. Conductivity is what we use to calculate uh, salinity of the water. <clears throat> And along with salinity and temperature, you should now know that that's the two important ingredients to calculating the uh, density. Um, I guess D could also stand for depth because it also measures, uh, you know, where you are in the water column. And this this little contraption may have as many as 10 to 30 bottles on it that are are tripped, so to speak, uh, open and closed at whatever depth um, you are interested in. So. That's how you get a whole depth profile over, you know, maybe as much as a thousand meters, but more commonly um, through the mixed layer over maybe 100, 150, 200 meters or so. So that's how we get these samples, and that's how often um, samples are collected for both uh, the phytoplankton and zooplankton, all these smaller organisms that can fit inside those bottles. Okay, so you should know now already um, from last lecture, if not before, that um, on a per meter square basis, um, uh, prime production is really high in coastal uh, regions. And today we're going to figure out why that's the case. Um, the short answer is upwelling, and the nutrients brought in by upwelling. Um, but if you're, at, if you're asked the question, you know, what part of the ocean um, uh, contributes the most to prime production in, in the total biosphere, you'd have to say the open ocean. It's not so much because the rates are high per meter square, but it's just that the open ocean is just a huge region. Much of the ocean, most of the ocean is open, not next to coast. Um, and the other point I, I, I made in the last lecture is the fact that although the phytoplankton biomass, the photoautotrophic biomass, is really low in the oceans, um, not only in, in the open ocean, definitely in the open ocean where the water is crystal clear, but even in coastal waters, it's, it's very low compared to what we see on land. Um, in spite of that, you, I hope you remember that the amount of prime production done in the oceans is roughly equal to that on land. You know, both of them are about 50% or so. Um, and so that means in terms of oxygen, both contribute about half of all the um, oxygen that we breathe each day. Um, and then in terms of, of course, um, carbon, um, both are, are, are doing about equal amount of half. Um, the, the oceans are can do all that work uh, with such low biomass, low numbers of organisms, because the growth rate of these organisms is really short. Uh, uh, the growth rate is really high, really fast. Um, and because the biomass is not um, increasing over time, generally speaking, overall, um, that means that these organisms are also dying really quickly. Um, and we'll, that's what we're going to be talking about next week, is how they're killed off. But now we're talking about how they grow. And um, although last uh, lecture we talked about the variation in uh, prime production and phytoplankton biomass over time, and especially you know, what's controlling the spring bloom, today we're going to be focusing on the spatial uh, variation of these organisms. And for the most part, we're not going to be dealing with the really complex uh, picture that you can see from satellites. So that's what you're seeing, of, of course, here. Chlorophyll, as you I'm sure know now, is our index, uh, a measure of phytoplankton biomass. There's a kind of imperfect, um, but pretty good relationship between the amount of chlorophyll A um, in a sample and the amount of uh, uh, phytoplankton biomass. So what you're looking at here is a satellite view of chlorophyll A. And you can see here's uh, Cape Cod and um, I guess Long Island and New York, and we're down somewhere over here, I guess. And showing the complex uh, uh, variation in chlorophyll with depth, uh, not with depth, sorry, but with spatial uh, differences in, in along the oceans. And we can see that that, that, that chlorophyll is varying with, um, in a complicated fashion with a sur sea surface temperature. So that's temperature on the, on the top axis there, the top 
uh, diagram. So the question why is what's happening here? What is that relationship? Um, just another um, uh, a picture. Um, this is a rather old picture, maybe apropos of the, uh, well, I guess it was tropical storm by the time it got to us. Uh, here is a picture from you know, a few years ago from Hurricane Bonnie. And sea whiffs is a type of satellite that's no longer up there. Um, it's, uh, I can't remember when it finally uh, failed and gave up to uh, uh, stop working. And it's, anyway, it's for measuring color, but for the most part, that means chlorophyll. Again, same thing. Here's the scale for color. And the hotter colors means very um, high concentrations of, of chlorophyll, again, uh, along the coast of of the, of the east coast um, and and again here we see the relationship with uh, sea surface temperature uh, i guess the point here is this tremendous variation that we see um, uh, as we go from one place in the ocean to another but today we're not going to be talking about that kind of smaller scale variation but much bigger variation in terms of why um, uh, uh, prime production is so high next to the coast so why is it so high next to the coast um, and also in equatorial Pacific? So, so the, basically there's the same answer uh, for both of these. Um, runoff from land certainly does contribute, nutrients from land does contribute to, to some of the variation that we see along this coast, on the coast, but not, not, it's not the primary reason why, um, why prime production is, is really high, for example, um, off the coast of, uh, of Peru. In South America, there are really no big rivers that go there. The you know, big river is, is the Amazon, which is going over this way. And you can see it's high there, but it's it's not certainly as high as we see on the other side of South America. And certainly uh, along our west coast, um, there's really no, there's Columbia River that's really big here. Um, but there's no other big rivers that are going into uh, to the Pacific Ocean along whole, uh, California. So, and yet there's still high rates of prior production. So why is that? Um, and, the, and the answer, of course, is upwelling. Now, uh, uh, I got these slides from a colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Matt Oliver, who used to do some work in New Jersey. So this is New Jersey, kind of hard to see. Here's Cape May, um, and we're again off the, off, oops, I was afraid of that, shouldn't have done that, sorry. Um, uh, anyway, we're off the, 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 the map here. and. Um, he he's showing this because of you know he was doing some work there and, and it had, he has a really neat diagram that I'll show you in a minute. Um, it's probably not the most famous upwelling um, in, 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 for our uh, coast. The more more important one I'd say is off of California and off the West Coast. But anyway, it illustrates the point. So again, you see this this uh, uh, correlation between temperature and chlorophyll. Um, and now, though, it's, it's an inverse correlation. That is, the colder temperatures is illustrated here by these cooler blue type of temperatures, down to 19, um, have some of the highest levels of chlorophyll. Again, um, the redder, the hotter colors. And you can see here, we see that high means one, two. It's, the units here are given as milligrams per meter cubed. More frequently, I think you'd see these as micrograms per liter. That's basically the same thing. It's just the, you know, the, you know, whether it's milligrams or micrograms. So anyway, it's it's for these waters is about you know one or two that's high. Generally from the oceans, that's high. In the Delaware Bay, th those values may be 10, 20 um, during during the summer. So again, anyway, the point here is with this diagram is showing this inverse relationship between temperature and chlorophyll, and that gives a hint about what's going on. And what's going on, of course, is, is upwelling. And upwelling basically, um, I hope some of this is a review, and, but I think it's important for, for uh, those who, who, who have not taken, what's that coastal, marine, no, I mean the uh, terrestrial, that comparison course, can't remember the, the mass number. Anyway, um, you probably have heard about this before, but it's worthwhile going over again, that on the East Coast, um, a, south, uh, from a south to north wind will cause um, water to move offshore via Ekman transport. And that will bring up water, um, upwelled water that's colder and nutrient rich from deeper, um, deeper waters. So that's basically wind-driven upwelling on our coast. And here's just a diagram. Um, this is the diagram I was talking uh, about before, illustrating what's happening when we have this wind that's going from the southwest to the northeast um, uh, off of our coast, and uh, again, we're a little bit off, but you can see New Jersey there. 
And when that wind is blowing from the southwest to the northeast, you can see that the, I'm kind of afraid to, to touch it, but basically the water is going, uh, is, is being pulled up, so to speak, from deeper waters. And that colder water is bringing up nutrients. And that's why I get up on it. So when it stops, basically, um, it's sometimes called a re relaxation period where the, because there's no more wind, there's no more mechanism to pull up the warm, the cold water and the warm surface water moves kind of back over the top of that and stops the upwelling. So, um, and so this is just a diagram to, to emphasize the fact that nutrients are high, very concentrated in deeper waters. Um, this is a really old diagram, really strange units are not used anymore. Basically it's the same as micromoles. And you can see in the deep waters, you can see as much as 20 to, to 40 micromoles of, of, of nitrate uh, in these waters. And you know, why is there a variation among the um, oceans? Um, a bit more complicated uh, answer to that that we're not gonna, I'm not gonna try to get into. Basically, it it's, uh, inv involves the uh, age of that deep water. It's rather young in, in the Atlantic Ocean and much older in the Pacific and Indian Ocean. Anyway, the point of this is to illustrate, again, that you see really high concentrations of nitrate in, uh, in down, down deep and less so uh, much lo low, lower concentration in surface waters. And kind of a trivial question, and this be a question to see if you're awake, are why are concentrations low in surface waters? Why is that? Well, obviously it's because of phytoplankton use of those nutrients um, way up here in the surface waters where they have plenty of light um, and they use those nutrients to, to carry out prior production. Okay, so, so as I mentioned, um, upwelling and also the opposite phenomena, downwelling, is much more uh, prevalent and much more important along the uh, west coast of our country and, um, and along the west coast of South America. And uh, often oceanographers talk about this as being eastern boundaries because they're taking an ocean perspective. They're looking at the ocean and looking that, and seeing that those upwelling events are happening on the east of that ocean. Um, our west coast. Again, same uh, processes are working, but now the wind has to go from the north, the northwest to the southeast in order to get that same movement of water by ecmic transport. So be, again, because of the Coriolis effect, Corley, Cor, uh, I'm going to have to see if I can spell it correctly, Coriolis effect, we see this movement of water to at a right angle in the in the uh, away from the direction of wind, as you as you in the northern hemisphere, that w that water is going to move at 90 degrees um, uh, perpendicular to the to the uh, wind, and that's again going to push off that water, the surface water, in this case to the west. And if you one way to think about it, is, I'd like to think about it, is leaving a hole here in the surface water that has to be filled, so to speak, by the water that's deeper. Uh, below that surface water and so that deeper water is colder and has high nutrients now as i mentioned when the opposite occurs when the wind is in uh, along the west coast um, and the wind is going from the south south uh, east to the northwest i had to think about that a little bit um, the opposite occurring the same principles are are at work so now instead of the water moving to the to the west you have the water moving to the east because the Coriolis effect is still moving right angles to the direction of the wind. But now that water is moving onshore and it's basically forcing the water to go down. And so we have a downwelling. Uh, so that's just the opposite of an upwelling, obviously. So here's just a, again, a satellite picture, uh, probably a sea wisp picture. Don't know the the uh, uh, when this was taken, but just illustrating the very high chlorophyll levels and this phytoplankton biomass. I think that's San Francisco. Um, it's also the upwelling is also the reason why San Francisco is very infamous for having cool, even cold um, uh, summers. Uh, uh, Mark Twain is very famous for saying that the coldest winter he spent was a summer in uh, San Francisco. And, and it's the, the temperatures are so cool along the coast because of upwelling. If you ever try to go swimming in those waters in the summer, um, I wouldn't advise it because it's really cold. Of course, if you go inland uh, on the other side of the mountains, um, it's a totally different story. It's, it's really hot in the summer.
Okay, so winds parallel to the coast are what's causing upwelling. It's because of the Coriolis effect. I think it was pretty close in the spelling. We get the movement of that water in the in the northern hemisphere um, when that um, water is moving to the south. Uh, when the wind is moving to the south, from north to the south, you'll get um, that surface water by ecmic transport moving offshore, and that's causing um, upwelling. In the uh, on our east coast, it's just the opposite. I mean, it's the same principles are are working. Nothing's changed. It's just that we have land on the on the west, and so in order to get upwelling, you have to have the wind move to the north on our on our east coast. So as that wind as that as that water deeper water comes up on shore, um, it's taking the place, so to speak, of that surface water that's been moved offshore by the Coriolis effect and extra transport. And that deeper water is colder and nutrient rich. And those nutrients, of course, are what's supporting the phytoplankton growth um, in the sunlit area of the oceans. So you should know now that prime production is stimulated along the coast because of upwelling. Not the, 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 uh, the, the uh, um, release of nutrients or the, the uh, input of nutrients by just uh, uh, runoff. That's, that is important in estuaries, um, but much less so in coastal waters. And the main reason why prime production is high in coastal waters is because of upwelling. And, and just to give away part of the story, that's why you see uh, very rich fisheries, uh, uh, very productive fisheries in coastal waters because, is because of upwelling. The Peruvian upwelling is a good example. California, again, is a good example. Um, so that that upwelling occurs because of the wind direction and the Coriolis effect pushing surface water offshore. Okay, so that explains what's happening near the coast. The question becomes, of course, what happens in the equatorial Pacific. So that's another place that we see upwelling in high nutrients, high nutrients in the, at the equator. And it's a little bit different, although the principles of what's, why there's an upwelling is, is basically exactly the same. Um, and what's happening here is because of the trade winds uh, from uh, both uh, north and south of the equator are moving in the same direction. They're basically moving from, I think about this a little bit, from east to west. Um, and, and again, because of the Coriolis effect, in the north, again, remember it's going to go on a right angle from the direction of the wind. It's moving the surface water to the, um, to the north. And in the south, it's moving it the, to the left. Uh, I don't think we mentioned that, but the Coriolis effect has the um, impact of moving that surface water to the left of the direction of the wind, 90 degrees. And as a result, you have this hole, so to speak, in surface water that is filled by the deeper, colder water from below. Deeper, colder water that also has high nutrients. And so for that reason, prior production is a little bit higher at the equator than what we see north or south of it in the certainly in, in the North Pacific gyre that we study quite a bit. Um, uh, and also, it's really, really low in the South Pacific gyre, which is much less well studied. Um, and so this is just a movie showing, um, again, a satellite, incredible satellite uh, picture of the, uh, of the upwelling that's occurring um, along the equator. So this is South America right here, and the equator, I guess, is right around there. Um, there's Panama. You can see the little little connection between Central America and South America. And you're seeing this, you know, a little bit um, more color that's appearing in that blue that's due to chlorophyll A. Uh, the, the top picture is, is another um, uh, satellite view of what's happening off of uh, Hawaii. Um, you know, a bit more complicated picture uh, and, and explanation for what's happening with these little bursts of prior production that are occurring there um, that I don't really want to get into. Okay, so that's that's upwelling, and and of course the upwelling is bringing in, um, bringing up uh, important what we call macronutrients. This is should be review. The most important is nitrate. Um, ammonium is not brought up by upwelling. This comes from grazing. We're going to hear more about next week. The grazers provide the the animals provide and excrete the ammonium. That's not coming up with upwelling. Upwelling also brings up phosphate. There's phosphate. And also silicate, and you should know already um, what silicate is. Who needs that? Not every organism needs it; only a few. Most importantly, of course, the diatoms need that. But uh, need silicate. Uh, 
Um, also, there are micronutrients, so-called micronutrients, because uh, organisms need much less of these nutrients. And, and there are several metals. They, basically, they, they are used as coenzymes um, and help out uh, uh, the enzyme function. So uh, now, given all those different nutrients, uh, an important question is asked, you know, which is most important? That is, which is limiting rates of prior production? and thus limiting the rest of the food chain? And the answer is for the ocean, usually, usually, probably should emphasize that is nitrogen. And again, uh, the most uh, abundant form, the, 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 the compound that's occurring in the highest concentrations is nitrate because of its high concentration in the deep waters. OK, so I, I mentioned that because that sets up a real paradox um, that puzzled oceanographers for a long time before it was solved back in the 19, 1990s about some places in the oceans that had really high nitrate concentrations. Now, generally in the open ocean um, in the North Pacific, uh, near Hawaii, and then um, in the Atlantic Ocean, you just don't see any nitrates. It's really, really hard to uh, measure. It may be on the order of nanomoles or so. Versus we, we saw in the deep ocean, we can see as much as 20 to 30 to 40 micromoles of nitrate in the deep ocean. So, so when we see these concentrations here, which are on the order of tens of uh, micromoles of nitrate, and then in the southern ocean, uh, even higher, basically what we see in the deep ocean. And the, the question is, how can that be? Um, and also we see in the equatorial Pacific, how can, be there, how can there be so much nitrate? Um, and, the, and the thing is also, uh, we see sometimes those concentrations of nitrate in estuaries, for example, or, or in the winter, um, you can see really high concentrations of nitrate. And you know what happens. There's a bloom. There's a bloom that occurs in the spring um, when the water column sta stabilizes. But in these waters, there's never any blooms. There's never any blooms. And so how can that be? So these, these areas are called sometimes called high nitrate, um, sometimes also called high nutrient if uh, you want to include all of them. And the only complication of that is sometimes there are some areas in the Southern Ocean uh, that silicate is, is also low. And that's a more complicated story that we won't get into. But in these, anyway, so in these areas, which I'm gonna tell you about in a minute, I kind of outlined them and identified them already, these so-called HNLC regions, all the major nutrients are present, nitrogen, phosphorus, and even and also silicate. And there's also enough light too. So, so it's not a question of that there's, um, uh, you know, light is limiting, uh, which is the case, of course, in the deep ocean. There's lots of nutrients, but there's no light. I mean, even in the Southern Ocean and in North uh, Subarctic Pacific, yeah, it's pretty dark in the winter. Um, but, the, but during the summer, there's still no blooms when there's plenty of light. Um, so what's going on? And the answer is, uh, so well, before I get to the answer, just point out again, we have three big regions, the Subarctic Pacific, the Equatorial Pacific, and the Southern Ocean. Those are the three big ones, Subarctic Pacific, Equatorial Pacific, and the Southern Ocean. And not quite as famous and not certainly not nearly as important in terms of, um, under, uh, of the carbon cycle. Um, you can get some uh, HNLC-like conditions um, in upwellings after the bloom has occurred in, in, uh, in, uh, along the coast of, of California and Peru. Um, I went on a cruise from, uh, uh, from uh, San Diego down to Rica, Chile, and went through some of these upwellings. And the whole point of that cruise was to look at these HNLC-like uh, conditions that we see after the bloom um, has, has, uh, has, has crashed. So, but the, the big three are, are these right there, Subarctic Pacific, Equatorial Pacific, and Southern Ocean. Definitely, of course, worthwhile remembering. And I put Southern Ocean in yellow to highlight because it's the big daddy of them all. It's the biggest one. It's the biggest one. It, it, it has the most area by far of, of the three. So, um, so what's characteristic about these? There's, there's nutrients that are being brought up actually by an upwelling like process. Again, uh, as I mentioned, there's uh, light is not limiting. Um, at least, certainly in the summer, there's plenty of light. And again, you know, the, the of course the whole characteristic of it is it's high uh, nitrate. Um, 
Now the the chlorophyll is is probably is higher than what we see in the in the gyres, but the point is that's low compared to the amount of nutrients that we see there. Now um, another uh, characteristic of these areas that should be um, should uh, confuse you is the fact that the phytoplankton um, are really small. We see, see lots of pico and nanoplankton. Um, and that should confuse you because you remember how we talked about that the big phytoplankton are found when nutrient concentrations are high. And yet here's a case where the nutrient concentrations are high, but in fact they're dominated by the small cells. It seems like the small cells are winning out here, not the big ones. And another characteristic of all these three places is that they're far from anything. And the only exception to that is the coastal waters, which, as I mentioned, after the bloom uh, caused by upwelling, um, they have HNLC-like um, uh, characteristics. And, and, and in some ways, though, these exceptions um, are, are, can be exceptions and have HNLC-like regions because the wind, the predominant winds are not helping out here. Um, and so that'll become clear in a minute when we when I talk about the importance of the wind. Okay, so what so who cares about this? Um, you know, is it just this kind of funky little quirky thing? Some parts of the ocean, but the rest of the ocean is working like we think it is. Well, it's a not such a small part of the ocean. That's part of the problem. It's a, especially the southern ocean is huge. Um, and, and so the thing is, is that if we can't explain what's happening with the HNLC HNLC like regions. Um, does that mean that, that that implies that we really don't understand what's happening at all in the other parts of the oceans, uh, which are, again, in some ways are, are not the majority. So really, you know, if we can't explain HNLC regions, it's saying we don't really know what's going on. Perhaps even more important um, is the fact that it has implications uh, for um, the carbon uh, cycle and ultimately uh, understanding climate change. Because when we see nutrients um, uh, that are not being used, these nutrients are not being used by the phytoplankton, it means the biological pump is not working as much as it should be. Okay, so what's the biological pump? Well, the biological pump is a term that's used to describe the, the role of biology in taking up CO2 from the atmosphere um, down into the ocean. Now, that initial step is done by physics. That's basically you know, in, in, in the uh, invasion of CO2 from the atmosphere into the water is done by physics. But then, of course, the phytoplankton use that CO2 and draw it down in lower concentrations. And that causes even more CO2 to go from the atmosphere to the oceans. Now, that won't help at all in terms of storing CO2, if, um, and which happens a lot, if that CO2 is just returned, if that organic matter made by the phytoplankton from that CO2 was just returned back to CO2 by respiration and grazing, which is what we're going to be talking about um, uh, next week. The biological pump is not only the uptake of the CO2, but also the sinking of that CO2 down to deep waters, down to deep waters. So it's and, and down to the waters that are out of contact with the atmosphere. So it's both things, the uptake of that CO2 and then the sinking of the resulting organic matter down to deep, deep ocean. So that represents a storage of CO2 and carbon away from the atmosphere and down into the deep ocean. And so that CO2, of course, is not um, in the atmosphere and it's not um, you know, contributing to, to the trapping of, of, uh, of, of heat. Um, and so if we did not have the biological pump, we would be even worse off than we are uh, because of the increase in CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. The oceans are, are have been taking up roughly uh, half of the carbon that we we're uh, spewing out into the atmosphere, um, and 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 the other half, of course, is accumulating in the atmosphere. There's there's some storage that's happening on land um, as uh, we allow some uh, old farmland, especially in the East Coast, uh, be turned back into forests. That's contributing to st carbon storage, um, but much of it's being done by the oceans. And so things would be even worse off in terms of climate change if we didn't have this biological pump that was taking CO2 from the atmosphere, converted it first to organic material, and then that organic material, some of it escapes and is, uh, is, is transported down to deep waters. So that's all based on nutrients, right? And what's the 
um, nutrient that's limiting all this? Well, you should remember that it's nitrogen. And so when we see high concentrations of, of nitrate in surface waters, it means that there's prime production that's not happening that seems like it should be happening. So that's why it's a big deal when we see these HNLC regions and why so much effort was, was, uh, was uh, spent trying to understand them and to understand the mechanism and it's still work uh, continuing on today. So what's the answer? One answer that was, that was hypothesized by Charlie Miller um, he's the author of the Miller and Wheeler book, um, and Charlie is a uh, is a uh, zooplankton ecologist, and he was working in the subarctic Pacific, especially. And in the subarctic Pacific, there's this really cute uh, guy, Neil Callanus, um, and Charlie had, had found out that they have a really unusual life cycle that um, allows them to be in the surface water the entire um, uh, time. And so he hypothesized there was grazing that was preventing the phytoplankton biomass from building up. And that, and that allowed some nutrients to, to exist in the surface layer um, uh, that, um, you know, if there were a bloom, um, it would strip them out. And he, he, th he, he, he thought that because these zooplankton were in that surface layer the entire time, a bloom can never develop, develop and strip the surface layer of the nutrients. Well, there is a role for that, and we'll talk a little bit more about this next week, about the role of, of grazing and controlling prime production and phytoplankton. Remember how I said the answer is nitrogen? It's a bit more complicated than that, but for now, um, remember that it's nitrogen. And, and Charlie was on to something, but it really is not the answer for why, uh, why there are HNLC regions. I was actually on some cruises back in the late 80s when I first got to Delaware with Charlie um, in the subarctic Pacific. Really bad. I mean, really rough part of the oceans. Um, I was basically sick for every, every day for a month. Well, the, the cruises were a month long, and I was sick every day for each of those cruises, which were, there were four of them. Anyway, it was a great series of cruises, and um, we were going out to sea just as another idea was coming along. The uh, idea that turned out to be a crack, and that is the HNLC regions are limited by iron. And it's a lack of iron that um, explains why they exist. And so without iron, which is, remember, one of those micronutrients that are needed by phytoplankton, by, needed by all of us um, to carry out um, their metabolism. So it, it explains everything, basically. So why is there so little iron in the HNLC, HNLC regions? Well, these, these places are far from land, so they're not getting land from uh, uh, iron from dust or rivers. Um, the iron that's coming up with upline, and this is especially um, uh, apropos for the uh, places close to land, is just not enough because of the complex chemistry of, of iron. There's more that settles out and, and does not come up with nitrate. There's some iron that um, that's, uh, comes from the grazers as they excrete out the nitrogen. They're also excreting out all the micronutrients, and iron is one of them. But again, um, that's not enough. Um, and so that idea was first put out. Um, I mean, the paper that really got everyone's attention um, was Martin and Fitzwater. Uh, Martin is uh, now passed away. And Fitzwater was actually a super technician who was doing all the work. Uh, Martin actually had polio and did not do the, any of the, um, was not able to go on the cruises and do the actual work. But he was the brains behind all the operation and came up with this, this idea about iron um, control and everything. It was really complicated uh, and controversial when it was first um, uh, 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 suggested. And there was big fights about uh, the, the various ideas about which explain HNLC regions. But eventually it was shown to be correct. So the sources of iron in the photic zone. Um, so the, you, you can get it from upwelling and, again, some regeneration from from the grazers, regeneration is a word that's used to describe the excretion of nutrients by the zooplankton. Um, if you're near a, a, a land, you can get it from outflow from rivers and dust from continents. And dust from continents is, is usually the, the most important, biggest source of iron. And this is showing the dust coming off the Sahara. And you can see here, this is a satellite view, obviously, uh, 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 illustrating why there's uh, all the dust that's coming from, from Africa. And it's because of that we see high amounts of iron um, 
in the, in the Atlantic oceans, and that's why there's no real um, HMLC regions at all in the Atlantic. Uh, the South Atlantic is a little bit less of a, of a, um, of a uh, you know, not as well studied. Uh, uh, certainly, as we start down the Southern Ocean, as you now know and should remember, it's um, one of the big HNLC regions. And, um, and the Equatorial Pacific, you can see why it has, um, it's one of the uh, uh, HNLC regions because it gets very little iron from the continents. Um, it's very far. The Pacific Ocean is huge, and so you're far from land um, in, in along the Equatorial Pacific. And remember, there's upline in the Equatorial Pacific, um, and so there's little little uh, there's lots of nutrients, but not enough iron to support um, our production. Um, okay, so um, uh, although Martin wasn't the first one, um, there were some ideas back in the 1930s, and generally in science you can go back and find someone who came up with the idea, though um, didn't have the experiment, didn't have the equipment for whatever reason, wasn't able to really prove the idea. But, um, and, and the big problem with working with iron, it's just that it's everywhere. I mean, it's just really, really tough to work with. Um, I've been on other cruises with the Martin Group and, and those guys just have to work, uh, work, uh, work, uh, work in these special containers they're basically all plastic. They wear these kind of sterile moon type shoot, uh, uh, clothes and suits to kind of prevent any contamination from their bodies. Uh, obviously, no jewelry is allowed, anything that has iron. Um, so it's really tough to, to, uh, to work with. And so it's development of trace metal techniques. Trace metals is a word to describe things like iron, which occur, occur in really, really small concentrations, picomolar levels of iron and some of these other metals. And as I mentioned, he was the one who first came up with this idea. So the evidence for the iron hypothesis, um, well, there's what's sometimes called the natural addition experiment. Basically, nature is doing it for us. And if you look downstream of islands, um, they often have high rates of prior production. That, that cruise um, that I mentioned I went on from uh, San Diego, California down to Chile, we stopped in the Galapagos Island, um, and the scientific reason, um, well, the, the you know the one of the real reasons, just to stop in the Galapagos and see the turtles and so on. But the scientific reason was to look downstream of those islands and see whether or not they had high prime production, and sure enough, they do. Um, probably the first things that were done though were shipboard experiments, where basically um, a, um, iron was added to bottles, and and basically um, those. The phytoplankton were followed after the addition of that iron, um, uh, and, 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 and the experiments showed that the bottles that received iron, you could see phytoplankton uh, spring up and grow, and there was drawdown or use of that nitrate. So when those experiments were first done, they were criticized because by the zooplankton people because the, the bottles uh, were known to be not so nice to the, to the zooplankton. Um, Lots of plankton don't like bottles, and they don't do well at all in bottles. It's hard to include all the zooplankton in the community. So that was even with that, those two sets of, of, uh, of data, there's still legitimate um, criticism of the iron hypothesis. But that, all that went away with the really um, uh, definitive experiments, where um, uh, Martin's uh, colleagues first. Uh, uh, Kenneth Coles out in, in uh, California uh, led some uh, work that where they added iron to the ocean. Yeah, they basically had a, a ship and they just dumped iron into the ocean. The, the challenge there is following the, um, the water with the iron. And there's uh, some work done uh, uh, using a, a, a inert tracer, SF3, I think it is, or is it F4? Three or four, which is a is a um, inert tracer that actually the physical oceanographers will use to to which can be measured really easily by by uh, uh, high pressure chromatography or, uh, and and by that they can follow the addition of uh, they can follow the water mass and therefore the you know where where that iron is moving and those experiments really conclusively showed that um, that when you add iron. Um, you can see the, the uh, phytoplankton grow. So there's no doubt about it that iron is really important in limiting growth of these, these organisms.
So that leads to um, some thoughts about, well, if you can stimulate a phytoplankton bloom um, by adding some iron, what about doing it on a really big scale? Remember how the fact that in these HNLC regions, the biological pump is not working and doing what it could be doing in terms of drawing down CO2 uh, because it has all these nutrients, but it's not getting enough iron. And the thing about iron, um, unlike other places where you could you know, think about adding other nutrients, you don't need a lot of iron. A lot of iron. Um, and in fact, um, you know, uh, we'll see in a moment that uh, some calculations were made uh, suggesting that you know, relatively small amounts of iron, doable amounts of iron, could be added to some of the HNLC regions and you could get um, some drawdown of CO2. So this idea of doing that type of fertilization is sometimes called geoengineering. And it's, it's perhaps not the most radical idea out there in terms of what we would do to help prevent or, or, or mitigate um, global change and global warming. Um, it's, it's uh, as, you know, I mean, there's really crazy ideas about injecting sulfur aerosols into the atmosphere and creating more clouds. We talk about how sulfur can be a cloud nucleation site. Um, other ideas about basically putting out um, big def uh, reflecting shields in, um, in, on satellites to just have less sunlight hitting the earth. Uh, so, so this one is, you know, a little bit more, uh, I don't know if it's more uh, easy to understand or less uh, uh, exotic than those other ones. But anyway, they're all examples of geoengineering. And so this is something that, that got to the popular press. Um, you know, here's um, a cartoon about it. This is a cartoon that, that uh, by the cartoonist uh, that's uh, in the Washington Post that's still around. Um, this is actually, uh, you can sh see the age of this. That's the first George Bush back in the uh, early 1990s or late 1980s, probably early 1990s when this all came about. Um, and, and Martin actually did say this about giving, giving me half a, to have this stuff there, yeah, give me half a tanker of iron, I'll give you the ice age. And what he's talking about, of course, is by if you take away the CO2, draw down the CO2 enough, you have less greenhouse gases and you have less warming of the planet. Um, to back up, you know, it's good that we have greenhouse gases. If we didn't, did not have greenhouse gases, we'd be more like Mars uh, and, and we'd be you know, much colder than where we are now. So some greenhouse gases are good. Of course, it's the uh, run, runaway concentrations of uh, not only CO2, but also methane that's creating uh, problems. So by adding, um, uh, adding the iron is thought to be one solution to the geoengineering, to, to, to the climate change problem. And uh, as I said, um, you know, it, it, it reached the popular press, as you can see here, and it was um, talked about. I think for the most part, I would say most oceanographers are not in favor of, the, of this. Um, uh, but, you know, it's something to think about as we uh, face the real challenges that are being posed by the increase in greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. So with that, we'll stop.